Scotty is not. Uh, okay. Um, I know that Dottie is not there today. Uh, she and I had talked a number of times about me coming and the intention was to be in person, but that didn't work out so well. Um, I am uh, in a recliner or a wheelchair pretty much the entire day. Um, I had a, a knee replacement that went well. Um, after lunch, after the surgery in the morning, I was uh, walking with the PT and my knee buckled and ruptured the patella uh, tendon. So I am uh, uh, I'm recovering and been told I've got six to eight weeks of total uh, non-weight bearing and um, non-bending. So I'm in a brace, but I appreciate that you guys have invited me here today. And I want us to talk about uh, uh, communion. And so I want to start today just sort of talking about the importance of food. Um, can you guys see the screen okay and me? Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. So um, one of the things that's really interesting is when you ask the question, what is a Lutheran understanding of the Eucharist, is you can't do that well without talking about sort of the evolution of how a Lutheran understanding of the Eucharist of communion came about. And you can't do that without talking about uh, the early church meals, uh, Jesus's own meals, uh, and moving through up to the Reformation and the practices uh, of sort of pre-Reformation and post-Reformation practices around communion, um, and then sort of moving into the future and what um, and to, into the present about what the meal uh, signifies and also what it leads us to do. Uh, and for a lot of Lutherans, thinking about what uh, their faith leads them to do is is difficult because. There is that great, we are saved by grace alone, uh, by faith alone, or, you know, that we don't need works. But the Lutheran understanding actually is we receive the gift of communion, and that leads to a task that we share that love, we share that community uh, with others. And so uh, we're going to talk just a little bit about a couple of those things. Uh, but the first thing I really want to talk about is food. All right, let's talk about food. Um, let's see. Uh, let me get to the. There you go. Um, these are all different kinds of pictures around food. So I want to ask in the classroom, um, and I can't see you anymore. There's something going on that I, I lose you, but I can hear you. Um, so what are some of your favorite meals? Mine is Thanksgiving because I love not only the meal of Thanksgiving, but the leftovers of Thanksgiving. So what are some of your like favorite summer meals or camp out meals or at the beach meals or holiday meals? Um, who's got one? What are, you, what are some of your favorite meals? Brunch. Brunch. Okay. That's a good one. Corn and tomatoes at the Jersey Shore. Ooh, yeah. That's awesome. So it's not just a food. It's located at the Jersey Shore. Gotcha. For me, anytime um, I'm with family or friends and we're all gathered around the table, there's something... It's like a holy moment to all be gathered around the table in conversation, sharing a meal together. It doesn't have to be a special occasion. That is yeah. a special occasion. Yeah. Anybody else? I went to a church in college that ate lunch together after the service every week. And it was something I really loved. Oh, yeah, that's cool. I love that. For me... You know, the thing that it, that is not just about the food about Thanksgiving is the the feeling and the family. Um, we have lived away from both of our families for so long and we like to go home for Christmas. So Thanksgiving has sort of become our just the three of us meal um, and Cindy cooks and I make deviled eggs and Shelby uh, eats three plates of mashed potatoes um, and it's just the three of us having the day and we eat when it's ready. Uh, we keep our sweats on, uh, PJs, whatever. And we just have a lazy, wonderful day. Uh, but when we eat, there is something holy about it. One of you said something uh, about holiness. There's something sacred about it. Um, one, we cannot survive without food. Um, we can go uh, about three minutes without breathing. Uh, we can go about three uh, days without water. Uh, we can go three weeks without food if um, we have enough fat to live off of for a while. Uh, 
but it's a very, very important part of our faith life uh, because it also is not just family meals, but it's community meals and then communion meals. And when we gather together around a table, whatever that table looks like, whether it's an altar rail or it's the center aisle where we process to receive communion and then go back, we're doing that meal in community. And because we're doing that, we do a ritual of how we prepare it, how we uh, announce it, how we serve it, how we clean up from it, how we, you know, all of those things are a part of this ritualization that has become so embedded in our lives. Some traditions very much stick by the tradition that kids can only have communion after they've taken classes for first communion. Other traditions allow children, if their parents would like, they can receive communion very early in their lives uh, uh, and or a blessing. Um, and there are other traditions that limit communion to only certain people that can receive communion. Uh, Missouri Synod Lutherans, uh, only members of their community can, can, can participate in the meal together. And anyone else that they have actually let into the room for the service, they have to exit uh, in some of those churches and not be present while communion is served. And we have traditions uh, like Wesleyan tradition that I grew up with that every time you gathered, you had communion. You didn't gather together as a class, as a, a discipleship group without having communion together. Um, but once the the Wesleyan tradition came to uh, America, there weren't enough preachers to serve communion. And so circuit riders would do, I don't know, you know, 10, 12, 15 churches and they would ride around. And when the preacher was there, that's when you had communion, which is where quarterly communion came from for the Wesleyan tradition, because with 12 churches, you showed up about once a quarter. Um, and so that's when uh, communion started. Uh, there are still churches today in many different traditions, including Lutheran and usually Episcopalians and Catholics who have communion every single Sunday. And there are others who have it the first Sunday of the month or only on, you know, uh, still only quarterly. But that meal is what's so important. And it's based on a tradition. And the tradition comes from the biblical text. And we're going to read one of those texts in just a little bit. But it's tradition based on, <clears throat> excuse me, the Last Supper. And one of the funny things uh, around, um, I, I guess it was Monday Thursday, uh, someone was posting a meme on Facebook. And it showed Jesus uh, with 12 disciples falling behind him. And there was a um, there was a check in station at a restaurant. Um, and he said, table for 26, uh, because they were only going to eat on one side. <laughs> and I thought that was pretty funny. Uh, but this is not even how they would be eating during first century. Uh, they would be eating around the room. They would be eating on the floor. Uh, reclined or seated uh, with cushions and pillows and all that kind of stuff. And certainly food uh, from their tradition, not anything that we eat. So the communion service has shifted over the years and it has changed significantly. Uh, some folks do bread and a cup. Uh, some folks do little wafers and little shot glasses. Uh, some during uh, COVID started using small communion cups that were sort of portable. What did Upper Dublin do about communion during COVID? Somebody want to answer that for me? The little kids. kids. You did the little ones that you put, you take the top off? Yes. Yeah. 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 A lot of churches ended up doing that. We did too. And uh, some of our older members really struggled with those things. And so we found a different set that actually looks like a wine glass. And you take the, the bottom off and the communion uh, wafer is there and it's a single pull on one end and a single pull on the other end, which makes it uh, much easier to use. Uh, and we continue to use that for some people who were uncomfortable uh, going back to uh, intention uh, because that wasn't, uh, it didn't feel as sanitary and it felt kind of risky. Uh, to do that. Are y'all back to full uh, communion with common cup where you pat, where you each drink from the cup or are y'all still doing something different? Tinction with pita bread. We you do tinction with pita bread? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. 
All right. One of the biggest, uh, I think, uh, since we're talking about COVID for a second, one of the biggest uh, things that happened that was kind of difficult for people. Um, hang on just a second. Cindy, could you turn my light, the, the line on over here? Oh, yeah. Thank you. Um, one of the things that became, I think, a little bit controversial around COVID uh, was congregations trying to figure out how to do com uh, communion during COVID. And some just, they they refused. They did no communion for, you know, upwards of two years. Uh, others uh, asked people in their homes uh, to have bread and some sort of beverage. Uh, and a communion prayer was prayed by the pastor and they would receive communion in their own homes and serve it to each other. Um, I'm wondering, did you guys uh, do something during COVID? What was y'all's decision? We we did. We invited people to find their um, a bread and some kind of a beverage in their own home, mm -hmm. and that's how we did it. Um, I think didn't we have a drive through for one of we did for, I, uh, for um, Ash, Ash Wednesday? Yeah, just oh, Ash. I, oh, Ashes, just and then the we Ashes. had a drive through. I think for. Monday, Thursday, oh, also. And at Christmas, I think you at could Christmas. drive through and you could get a communion uh, yep. cup and, and wafer for yeah. so that you could celebrate and use that at home. Yeah, yeah. Um, we did the same thing you guys did. We did communion at home. Um, and I'm telling you, I've never seen a Facebook argument explode like the argument early on uh, in March. Uh, when we first sort of shut down in Pennsylvania, I think it was around the 15th of March, something like that. I'm not sure. Um, and so it wasn't a communion Sunday for, for Glory Day. We do communion on the first Sunday of the month, but it was communion Sunday for a lot of congregations and people were scrambling. They were trying to figure out the theology behind it, if it was allowed, if it wasn't allowed. I mean, it was really kind of clear that it was a really hard decision. And there were some bishops and some synods who said immediately, you cannot do at home communion. You, you know, you just have to, uh, you just have to say, we're going to abstain from the, the sacrament until we're back in person. Um, and there were other bishops who said, make a decision based on your context. Um, I think that's what Patricia Davenport did. She said, make the best decision based on your practices. Um, and, you know, I had people who would would ask me uh, as a professor of worship and preaching, but primary pe preaching, they would say, what do you think? And I said, well, well, let me start the conversation by saying I have a very liberal, progressive understanding of communion. And that is that anyone who wants to be in relationship with Jesus, no matter their age, their distinctions of any other you know, way of, of who they are, uh, no matter their attendance or membership or whatever, if they want to receive communion, they can receive communion. Um, and that's my tradition. And so for me, it made sense. I wasn't going to deny anybody communion. And so, uh, you know, I would ask them to hold the bread when I did the, the um, uh, Jesus took the bread, broke it and gave it to his disciples. Um, and I would have them hold whatever cup they were using. Uh, and early on, I, I even asked them to take pictures of their communion elements with them uh, and send them to me. And that was kind of cool, just sort of seeing uh, what they were using. And some people were using coffee cake and, uh, you know, a cup of tea or coffee. And some people literally got some bread and had a glass of wine. And um, I, one family sent me a picture and their kids had milk and had some Oreos. And I thought, now that's communion uh, done right. But there are people in many different traditions would say that what we did uh, was absolutely inappropriate and should not have been done. Uh, and there were some of my students, some Lutheran pastors who were my students, who were just, I mean, so disappointed uh, that some of their colleagues and, and some of their professors were uh, allowing communion to be done at home. Uh, so let's talk just for a second about what it is that is going on in uh, in the, the sacrament. So uh, when you, you have a sacrament, it's something that you hold sacred. It is something that sort of traditionally unites us like baptism, like communion for us in the the uh, in the Protestant tradition. Uh, Catholics have seven sacraments. And so they have, you know, uh, last rites, which is not called that anymore. They have confession, they have marriage, they have ordination, uh, they have confirmation, baptism, and, and Eucharist. 
uh, and sort of uh, all of those things bring people together. And it is an act that God participates in. As I said, for Protestants, we usually only do, uh, we, the vast majority of Protestants only do two sacraments, baptism and Eucharist. And um, the thing about sacraments is they can join us together, but they can also pull us apart, which is what we were just talking about a little bit uh, about, uh, um, about communion during COVID. And one of the things about a sacrament is I, I think we hold those things different, right? And so one of the things that happens in a sacrament is we're trying to bring people together. Um, one of the things that happened during uh, COVID uh, for a lot of us is that we had a number of babies that were born and the families were so anxious to not wait until COVID was over uh, to, uh, to baptize their children. And that goes back to this long, long old tradition that you had to get the baby baptized as quickly as possible because um, in Roman Catholic or Catholic traditions um, early on, they didn't, if you didn't baptize a baby, if the baby died, the baby was not going to go to heaven. Uh, the baby would go uh, to purgatory or um, I guess uh, to, it would be in limbo. Uh, and uh, it wasn't until the last probably 30 years that the Catholics uh, sort of put limbo literally in limbo. Uh, they've never completely ended the, the understanding of it, uh, but they no longer talk about that. Um, to the point, I think uh, when uh, we were in New Jersey, um, a couple of babies were born to friends of Shelby, and they literally had the baptism within five to seven days because they didn't want to risk the baby um, not going to heaven. Uh, and in some traditions, uh, in some of those families, they let no one visit in the home. The baby was born, they took the baby home, and nobody visited because they didn't want anyone to bring germs in that might uh, put the baby at risk uh, before they were baptized. So one of the things that's happening in the sacraments, baptism, you're taking the water and people use different water. Uh, I brought back water from the Dead Sea. Uh, no, not the Dead Sea, uh, from the River Jordan. I brought water uh, back from Mary's Well. And, the Dead sea. and what did I bring some back from the Dead Sea? Yeah. Um, and the water that was the grossest uh, was the River Jordan. It is so backed up and it is so brackish that um, in a water bottle that I have, if I shake it about the bottom third is like really gross sort of uh, sludge kind of stuff. Um, we had brought water back from um, from Russia when we had Shelby, uh, when we brought Shelby home, when we, uh, we adopted him. And we used uh, that water together with some water from the Jordan River that my dad had and mom had brought home when we baptized him. And the, the truth is it can be tap water. It can be any kind of water whatsoever, running water, uh, you know, anything. And what happens is that water combined with the act of God, you know, when we pray over that water, did it become a vessel for the, the baptism and the, and the sanctification and the, and the redemption of that child? And we use that water that's been blessed. And it is God's activity that through the pastor presents this child and baptizes them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And um, what is done is a powerful and profound thing. And it is done with simple water. And when we look at the second sacrament, which is Eucharist, the same thing is happening. There's this activity where we have objects, bread and wine, or some sort of wafer and juice, whatever it is that we use. It is those objects that when we pray the prayer of, an, uh, of um, um, institution. institution, sorry, my brain just uh, had a little uh, snafu. When we pray that the, the words of the institution and we pray those words over we, particularly the Epiclesis we'll talk in a little bit, which is the request for the Holy Spirit to come down and into those elements so that they become for us uh, what it is that we understand to be happening in that sacrament. And we'll talk just a little bit uh, in a minute about what that actually is. So um, any questions so far? Y'all following? Everything good? Yeah, you're good. All right. 
So one of the things I want us to talk about, but we can't get away without talking about this, is the role of memory in communion. When Jesus does the, the Lord's Supper, he says, do this in remembrance of me. And it is that remembrance that is so powerful for us. And in Latin, there are two really important, excuse me, in Greek, there are two very different, uh, two different words that we use when we talk about communion that are really powerful. And one of those is anamnesis. And what anamnesis is, um, is that you bring something in the past into your person in this profound, personal, religious, sacramental way. And it, you remember things through that, right? So in, um, I, I talked to my sisters uh, when we adopted Shelby and they had given birth to their children. And I asked, what is the memory that you have of your children coming into the world? And they were like, I remember all of the prayers that we prayed before it. I remember the moment of the birth, the pain, and then the ecstasy, this just ecstatic joy of having that child in my arms that I've been carrying. And I asked them, what are you the most hopeful about? And they're like, I want that memory of that sacredness of that love just crystallized in that moment to lead this kid into a life that's going to be fulfilling and wonderful and that they're going to, to, to be excited about. So anamnesis really is about taking a past event and you make them real in the present. So in the birth, you do a birthday party, right? Now that far doesn't come close to what the what we're talking about in communion in some ways, because that is a, a familiar, a personal, a physical memory. What's happening in the the communion rite in Eucharist is you are bringing what Christ did with his disciples into the present, and you're doing it by receiving the elements. And when you do that, you're called to remember the events of the past to remember what Jesus did, remember who Jesus was, remember what that means for us living in the in, in the current time period, right? So we're bringing that, that, that memory that goes to the marrow of our bones. Um, and I think that's really, really important part of what's happening in communion. But there's also this second part, and that is prolepsis, which is bringing the future into our present. So it's anticipating so in the meal, we're remembering Jesus' life and, and, and teachings and communion. We're also looking forward to what will happen in the end time, right? That brings into focus what's in the past and what's in the future. And those things breezes, bring us into a communion moment where we're remembering the past, but anticipating what God is going to do in the future. Does that make sense to you guys? Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. Do any of you, so when you receive communion, what is the feeling that you get? Anyone in the room, what, what do you feel personally? What do you feel physically? What do you feel uh, when you're receiving communion? Anybody? I feel closeness to God. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else? Same closeness to God. Yeah. It's that moment where you are receiving what is in different traditions, sometimes the actual blood and body of Christ, and sometimes a, a symbol or a memory uh, of the uh, body and blood of Christ. And when you receive that, it changes you. It makes you feel closer to God. It makes you feel like, you know, things uh, are, uh, are better than maybe they are. Um, I remember when we got together for the first time when we started having communion together, we were still using the, the cups, uh, but we did, and we passed them around to the pews or, you know, people pick, picked them up before uh, and then we passed them around to anyone who didn't have them. Uh, and people kept saying, I'm in the room, but I can't come forward yet. When are we going to come forward yet? When are we going to come and take communion in that spot where I've always taken communion? When are we going to get to the point where we're see, you know, we're kneeling or standing at the altar rail? 
uh, where I had communion with my husband who's no longer with us, where my children had their first communion, where, you know, my parents brought me when I was a child. Um, and that was a profound moment. And we finally got to that moment. Um, people literally had tears running down their cheeks because they were, they were in the place they were in the spot. They were in the moment where they were remembering Christ's acts in the past and looking forward to what God's acts in the past through Christ and God's acts in the future. Uh, and it was profoundly powerful. And it was for me, too. I choked up a number of times, uh, you know, the first couple of months after we started having communion because it was just so profound. Um, so one of the things I want us to do, does anyone have a Bible? No. Or could you guys, can someone grab a Bible or pull something up on their phone? <laughs> yes. Well, go ahead. All right. If someone will do Luke 22, 24 to 33. And if someone else will do 1 Corinthians 11, 24, 25. I have the Luke 22. All right. Would you go ahead and read that for us? What's your name? When the, when the hour came, he took his place at the table and the apostles with him. He said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took a cup and after giving thanks, he said, take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Then he took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And he did the same with the cup after supper, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. But see, the one who betrays me is with me, and his hand is on the table. For the Son of Man is going as it has been determined, but woe to that one by whom he is betrayed. Then they began to ask one another which one of them it could be who would do this. Yeah. So a profound uh, piece, and we have that communion, the Last Supper, sort of uh, in several different texts. But someone else read the First Corinthians 11, 24 to 25 as well. First, when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant and my blood do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Yeah. So nearly all of the gospel texts and other texts like first Corinthians that talk about communion, it's about memory. And so one of the things that's absolutely primary in whatever tradition you're in and including, you know, that includes Lutheran traditions and their understanding of the Eucharist is that memory is very, very important in that. And it's that remembering from the past acts into the present and moving into the future. So let's talk just a little bit about uh, in the early church, they had communion. Whenever they gathered, Jesus uh, set that example for them. They continue to have communion. Up until the Reformation, uh, laity were not given the cup. Uh, they were only given the bread. And there was a significant space that separated the people from the actual liturgy. So let's think about your typical Lutheran church. So you've got the back wall behind the altar area, right? And then you have this space in some, in others, there's not a space, but you have that, that space between the back wall and the communion table. And then you have the communion table towards where the preaching, uh, the pulpit in the, in the, uh, uh, might be the lectern. And then you have that space past that, maybe stairs down. Uh, and then you have space between the stairs down and the altar rails. And then you have space to the first pews. And then you have space to what, row five, six, before you actually have a person sitting there <laughs> in a lot of different traditions. 
Um, and so one of the things that happened is that the, the lady were kept from the bread and it was very far from them. And so you start talking about communion that the blood and the body of Christ are being presented, but you don't get the bread. It just, uh, I'm sure that there was a part of it that they thought, okay, we're just not deserving enough. The the clergy are the ones who are special and they get to be uh, served the bread. But one of the one of the the complaints of Martin Luther was that communion celebrated as Christ intended for it to be celebrated was for everybody. And um, one of the things that he taught was that there was this priesthood of all believers that we all take on the priestly function of sharing the faith with others. And that as believers, there should be no distinction uh, between the bread and the cup, the laity and the clergy. Everybody ought to be served. And for me, one of the highlights of sort of Lutheran theology is that it it's for everybody, right? It is it is not something to be withheld. It's also not something that we give sort of as a reward for you doing good stuff. Um, the Eucharist is Christ's feast, and it is important. Um, the Roman Catholic Church often talked about communion as a um, as a great mystery, as a miracle, and Luther completely rejected the idea that the communion service, that the sacrament of, of Holy Communion was this miracle that only a priest could do and that only this, the, you know, the special ones could be a part of it. And that comes from the understanding, which we'll talk about in just a second, of how they understand what happens to the objects. And probably this is going to be the primary way that Luther and the Lutheran tradition set themselves up against uh, the Roman Catholic Church and the way that the sacrament had been understand, understood uh, for a long time. So there's three main ways that communion uh, understands, or three uh, communion, sorry, three ways that people understand what happens to the elements, all right? So the first one is uh, transubstantiation. And that is the Roman Catholic tradition and still holds today. Uh, it was uh, talked about and taught by two uh, great thinkers, like the third century, I think, maybe the fourth, uh, Ambrose and uh, Aristotle uh, before. And one of the things that they taught was that in the communion moment, when that blood, the, the words of institution were proclaimed. A miracle occurred and the bread turned into the body of Christ, the literal body of Christ, and that the wine, more typically during that time period, the wine became the actual blood of Christ. And in those, in that moment, they were trans, the, the, the substance was changed. And so whatever was there before it became the actual body and blood of Christ. And Luther rejected that totally. He said, it's not some miracle that's happening um, that changes. Christ is with us all the time. So Christ is present. We're not calling Christ to come down and be a part of the elements. Christ is already part of the elements. And so for Luther's uh, Luther, he said that uh, because Christ is everywhere, then the bread and the wine are present in, with, and under the physical elements. Have y'all heard that phrase before? Oh, yeah. 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 That in, with, and under the physical elements were both the body and blood of Christ, not quite literally, but they were also bread and wine. And when you receive that, that you they weren't literally changing, but they have changed in how we receive them, that they are that God is in all of the things and we're not like you know taking up this special miraculous meal. Um, my growing up was a memorialization. Um, the Eucharist was a symbol, and so we use the meal to remember, but uh, nothing changed, nothing, uh, nothing converted uh, in any way. Uh, it was a memorial. 
What's interesting is that Luther was a great proponent of consubstantiation. And, uh, you know, when you start looking for Lutheran uh, resources about the Eucharist, um, you'll come, you'll get these questions like, uh, do Lutherans actually believe in, in the, uh, in, in the Eucharist? And it's like, yes, they just don't believe what Roman Catholics believe about what happened in the Eucharist. And so these kind of things are very important because when we make a decision, and this is what Luther did, he said, I reject that. And so we have to figure out what it means for us. And it's true of all of us. When we're looking at something or we're hearing, uh, you know, a new political theory or we're hearing a piece of, of uh, uh, a religious tradition uh, or we're even um, sort of talking about our own families and what's going to happen and things like that. Often we make decisions about what we believe because we say, I don't believe that. You know what I mean? That's true. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's it's often you know I say oh no that's not what I believe and so then you have to go okay what do I believe and um, that's really important and it's a differentiation that our kids need to learn and sometimes they don't learn that as well as the or as early as they want to remember their prefrontal cortex doesn't completely uh, you know become uh, in play until they're in, like in their late mid to late twenties. Uh, I can attest to that. I have a child that's about to be 25 and his prefrontal cortex is not in play yet. <laughs> so you probably remember those days as well. And so one of the things that happens is Lutherans believe the real presence is there. And the, the, the thing that's so powerful is that you it's presented to you, it's offered to you, it's received. And then one of the things that happens is it's a gift and a task. I said that early on, it is a gift and a task. And so what happens to us when we go to communion for Lutherans is it is what is called a part of the means of grace. Have you heard that before, the means of grace in Lutheranism? Yes. It's how we experience our the grace that God gives to us. And it can happen during study, during communion, during, you know, uh, the ways that we uh, baptize, the way we get confirmed and all these things that lead us to be disciples. And so um, the gift of communion is that because of Luther, that change occurred so that all people received both elements of communion. And it was it, um, it was complete. I mean, imagine if you went to communion today at Upper Dublin and uh, you can't, they came out with the communion and they they were doing the in front behind the altar. They were doing the words of institution. They broke the bread. They poured the cup. They came forward with the cup and you didn't receive the bread. Because you weren't thought to be worthy of that. Right. Um, and it's one of those things that is still used against people. And it's still used not just because someone said you're not worthy, but it's still used because some people feel I'm not worthy. This is a holy and sacred moment. And there are lots of folks out there who don't believe that I'm worthy of communion. And so I'm not going to come forward. Aaron? Yeah. I was 16 years old. And I was getting ready for my first communion at confirmation. It was 1964. Yeah. Our Sunday school teacher was the daughter of a very prominent Lutheran theologian taught at the Midwest. And she sat in the front of the church. And as we got ready to take communion, we went row by row from the front and she wouldn't, she didn't take communion. Yeah. She was the most pious person in the whole congregation. So she's, she's judging us as we go forward to take communion because if she's not, she says she's not worthy, then what makes the rest of us? We look like jerks. Mm. So that really, that really uh, impacted my, my growing up. I realized that she was judging God based on my confirmation lessons. She yeah. was telling God that God's judgment was not adequate to give this free gift. And so we weren't all wrong. She was misguided. I, I completely agree with you that she was misguided. I, I had a, I was teaching a class in Gettysburg a couple of years ago, this pre-COVID. 
uh, and one of my students was, we were talking about the Eucharist, and one of my students said um, that the most holy moment he had ever had in his life was when his brother, who he had been estranged from for like 15 years, 16 years, his brother was an alcoholic, his brother was an addict, had done drugs, uh, he had lived, you know, in a homeless uh, situation for a number of years, and and he didn't know at the time what had happened with his brother, but his brother had been invited into a church um, by someone who saw him laying on the ground outside, you know, covered with newspapers and stuff. And he had come into the church and they had offered him a coat. They had offered him some socks. They, had, you know, they had a, a, a sort of a, a room where they had all this stuff available. Uh, and then they brought him into worship. And they invited him to come up for communion. And he kept saying, no, 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 no. And the, the student didn't know this at the time. He learned this later. Um, and the the guy said, no, I, I can't take communion. I can't take communion. And they were like, no, you can. It's okay. God loves you. It's okay for you to come up. And he said, no, 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 no. I, I can't take communion. So they kind of left him alone. And he sat there. And um, a couple of weeks after that, he showed up at his brother's church. and um, he, so my student, his name was Mark. Mark was standing there and he saw his brother and he hadn't seen him in like 15 or 16 years um, and knew he was living rough, right? That he was living, you know, probably in dope dens and, uh, you know, in camps and uh, that kind of stuff. And and he looked actually fairly good. And uh, Mark hadn't seen him in, in years and he preaches this sermon, He you know, to get to the time uh, of communion. And um He's not sure whether or not his brother will come up. And so in the invitation, he was really clear, no matter what has happened in your life, no matter how much pain you live in, no matter how much you think you're not worthy, everyone is worthy at the table. And so he's serving and um, about midway through the service, his brother comes up and he kneels at the altar rail and he puts his hands out in front of him to receive communion. And Mark said that his hands... Uh, were somewhat clean, but they were beaten up. You know, they had all kinds of, of, uh, of you know, scars, all that kind of stuff in his hands. And he put his hands out. Mark walked by to put the bread in his brother's hands. And his brother closed his hands over Mark's and said, forgive me. And Mark said, I forgive you. Do you forgive me? And his brother said, yes. And he opened up his hands and so both hands were touching the bread at the same moment. And he said it was the holiest moment he had ever experienced in his life because it was not just the bread that was there. It was the brothers that were there. It was God that was there. It's the memories both in the past and hope for, for the future. Um, and his brother stayed straight uh, for a couple more years, but he lost track uh, of him in COVID uh, and felt like he probably uh, would either had passed away um, uh, Mark told me this a couple of months ago. We, I saw him at a uh, at an event, and Mark said he does, he has no idea where his brother is or what happened to him. But that moment continues to be this gift for both of them. And what it does is it gives us this momentum, this challenge to move forward, uh, and out of that gift to give the gift of grace and love to others. Now, I know we need to uh, close up. I'm going to um, just briefly uh, talk about the ways that we receive communion. Um, and y'all experienced some of these during uh, um, COVID. Uh, and so uh, just intention or the little cups, the common cup. Um, so I, I lost you again. I can't see you, but I want just a couple of minutes. We got a couple of minutes uh, for any questions or comments. The final thing I want to say is Lutheran communion, the Lutheran understanding of communion is an inclusive communion. It is a communion that welcomes everyone. It is a communion that says, no matter how you've lived, if you want to be in right relationship with God, you are welcome at this table. It is a communion that says, we're going to fling wide the, the invitation and grow the table because we want everybody to be a part of what we're experiencing in communion. Uh, and it is this amazing gift. And every time that I do the ritual, I get choked up, sometimes more than others. But to be in the position to do that, 
to invoke the words of institution and to share communion in the hands uh, of folks is really, really powerful. And that's what Lutheran Eucharist is about. It's about receiving that gift and then giving that gift to others. So I don't see your picture anymore, but I want to see if anyone has like some final thoughts or some questions. We got maybe a minute. People hear that message every time they take communion here. Yeah. But it certainly is a message that has changed through the years. One more time. It has changed. The Lutheran message was not always that. I yeah. grew up where it was specific rules as to your age, what you had to go through, how many years of confirmation class three yeah. before you could take communion. Thank you. I it didn't, didn't always be the inclusive. And it's such yeah, and, and and you know, I, I think I speak from a from my own experience around Lutheranism because I was a part of Gloria Day for seven years. And so they really do sort of bring wide the, the tradition. But at the same time, they are very clear that there is a first communion tradition that you go through classes, you go through first uh, communion classes, you go through confirmation, and some families adhere to that and some families don't. And so you're right, in some traditions, there still are some of those rules uh, and, uh, I, but there's a way to get to that, right? And so even if you have rules of who can and who can't, there's a way by which grace-filled uh, instruction happens so you can receive communion. Do you see what I mean? I you have that opportunity. It's still there because you can participate in those processes that bring you to the table. Well, we we have children Karen. who receive communion when they're two. And then they get to be a certain age and they say, we'd like to get a first communion class. Yeah. Um, that's kind of that's kind of what, what my experience in the Methodist church is too. Uh, you know, I anyone who wants to receive communion, if you want your kids to receive communion, you can do that. Uh, but I, I never went to a first communion class. Never. Uh, I went to confirmation class and we learned about communion, uh, but there was not a tradition of first communion. And you know, those of you who know, uh, there are some churches where, you know, you have to do two years of uh, of confirmation and first communion. You put on your white suit. You come and have this big, you know, wonderful first communion Sunday. You have, a, you know, you have your whole family together. You have a big meal. Um, and, you know, I, I have no problem with people doing that. It's it's the thing that that brings us together as Christians uh, but also, as I said at the very beginning, it can sort of tear us apart if we uh, get in those situations where you can receive, but you can't. Um, and I, as I said, for, you know me, I'm progressive. I'm on the, the liberal end. I'm going to say, yep, you get to have communion. If the question is asked, yes, you get to have communion. Uh, and I think it, however way you get to that moment is okay. Um, I, I, I just never in my career do I ever want to deny communion to someone. Um, and throughout tradition, there have been people who were refused communion uh, during the 1980s when the AIDS crisis was really, really hitting. Uh, there were churches who made a conscious decision that they would not serve communion to anyone uh, who had gay cancer. Uh, and if you had any kind of, sh of visible um, uh, AIDS um, uh, lesions that they wouldn't serve you commun communion. And I actually had a friend uh, who had lesions and went up in his Roman Catholic church to receive communion because he knew he was sick and he wanted to receive. And, you know, but he hadn't been a participant. He hadn't been giving, uh, but he tried to, uh, he went up because he wanted communion. And he looked at the priest and he said, please. And the priest said, please remove yourself from the altar room. Oh, wow. <laughs> it happened to my husband at a, at a friend's daughter's wedding. He oh, was, wow. Yeah. And, uh, and the, the priest gave me communion, and um, and the priest did not state any rules before the communion. So he gave me communion. He was behind me, and he's walking behind me back to the pew, and he's swearing. Da, 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 da. Yeah. No wonder Martin Luther. Da, da, da. <laughs> so whatever happened to you? He said, the priest looked me looked at me in the eye and said, are you Catholic? And he said, no, but I'm Christian. And, and Arnie said, how the heck did he know I wasn't Catholic? I said, because you sang too well. <laughs> oh. That's um, terrible. 
All right, thank you guys so much for being here and participating today. Thank you for letting me come into your uh, your class today and, and talk. I hope you got a better understanding of Lutheran tradition or at least uh, around the Eucharist or uh, something you're going to take away with you, a nugget that will help you as you move forward. It is a gift and it calls us to share that gift with others by love and grace and forgiveness. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you. 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 Th